just one second. Sorry. Uh, so is is Professor Casaroy's there? Is he ready? Yes, yes. yes I am. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm Thanks sorry, I wasn't seeing you on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so once again, welcome back. I would like to thank again, Professor Guilherme Casaron for being here with us. Uh, so we're going to start um, this special session. We are really proud and honored to have Professor Guilherme with us. Uh, the session is From Boom to Bust, How Emerging Power, Brazil Became a Global Peria. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about Professor Guilherme. Uh, Professor Guilherme Casarões is one of the greatest and most acknowledged experts on the complex movement of the far right, especially in Brazil and Latin America. He's currently a professor at Fundação Getúlio Vargas and will delight us with his insights on this multifaceted matter, right? <laughs> professor Guilherme, the floor is yours. Luciana, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm so glad to be back. Unfortunately, I'm not, uh, not physically in Belarus, <laughs> but I will be in a couple of days, really. So, um, yeah, but uh, since th that was a virtual session anyways, um, I decided to do it from, from Sao Paulo. But anyways, um, I'm um, an alumnus of UFMG, so I'm, I'm thrilled to be back, not only because... Uh, this is something I've been studying for a long time, but also because I really appreciate I re the efforts of U UFMG's uh, International uh, um, Relations Department, and um, I have many friends there, and of course the students are always uh, top-notch, so it's great to have this conversation with uh, foreign students who've for some reason decided to go to Belo Horizonte and to UFMG to um, to deepen their knowledge about Brazil. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, speaking of a very contentious issue, so I've heard that um, you've had a few classes on Brazil before, history, geography. Um, some of the previous professors decided not to touch upon the political, the most contentious and, and controversial political issues. So um, I'm going to jump right into them. Of course, um, my focus is going to be foreign policy. Um, as promised by the title <laughs> of the lecture. Uh, but of course, feel free to ask me questions about the political scenario as well. There are elections coming up in less than 100 days. So um, I'm, I'm pretty sure some of you are uh, interested and a bit curious about what, what's going to happen. Um, so I can talk about this as well. Of course, uh, from a foreign policy perspective, there are some interesting issues to discuss, so I'm going to dedicate uh, some of my final remarks to what I think might happen uh, in terms of our foreign policy, depending on the election's results, right? Um, I'm going to share my screen with you. Is the sound okay, by the way? Okay, it's one of the first times I, I don't wear a microphone, uh, like a, an earphone, but I think it's, um, I think it's working fine. Um, let me share my presentation with you guys. Um, so as, um, as said before, the title of my presentation is from, from Boom to Bust, How Emerging Power Brazil Became a Global Pariah. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you have seen in international media some very uh, ominous depictions of, of Brazil in, in the last three or four years. People have criticized the way Brazil's, uh, the way the Brazilian government has dealt with the, the Amazon fires um, and the environmental agenda more broadly. People have criticized the way Brazil, the Brazilian government more specifically, has dealt with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's not uh, uh, rare to find uh, international political commenta commentators and analysts saying that Brazil has, uh, has gone into this uh, condition of total global isolation. So um, this is something that has called my attention ever since this process began back in 2013 or 2014. I'm going to focus on the process. I'm going to talk about uh, the last decade or so, a little bit further perhaps. I'm going to go back to the early 2000s. 
to uh, discuss two uh, of these uh, very interesting and rather depressing issues with you. First of all, how Brazil uh, became an emerging power in the first place. Um, I remember teaching foreign students back in 2012, 2011, and everyone was so excited and thrilled to be in Brazil because Brazil was the was the 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 ball in the court. So every everyone was interested to uh, learn more about Brazil, to invest in Brazil, to come to this country, because everybody was talking about it positively. And ten years later. Um, I consider some of you guys uh, heroes <laughs> to come to Brazil in such a chaotic context. But of course, um, there are still many great things about the country. But when it comes to foreign policy and to politics more broadly, uh, we have to sit down and have a long talk about uh, whatever's going on. So um, that's the story that I'm going to tell you. And the focus will be, first of all, on how Brazil rose to the condition of an emerging power. And then how Brazil uh, was dragged into this uh, global pariah status, uh, which is no good for anyone. I mean, Brazil has played a very important role in the world. And uh, I, I'd say, um, and I'm sorry for that, but a world without Brazil, especially when it comes to some specific multilateral issues, uh, is not as good. Right, and I'm not saying this because I'm a Brazilian, but also, but but I, I'm I'm a foreign policy expert, so I, I I really believe in the contribution of Brazil to foreign affairs, uh, in general, and that's the reason why I think that uh, Brazil as a global pariah uh, should be just a temporary status. Right, I wish that uh, from from next year on we can just go back to uh, to the the condition of a, a global player or a, a global protagonist, if I could put it this way. So my name is Guilherme Casarões. I'm a professor at the Getulio Vargas Foundation here in Sao Paulo. I'm an alumnus, as I said, um, of UFMG. Um, and um, I've been doing research on foreign policy issues for the last 12, 13 years. So ever since 20, 2009, 2010, I've been um, dedicating my, my research agenda to um, all foreign policy matters you could think of. With a focus on Brazil, of course, but also as a political scientist, I have to compare a lot. So I've been comparing Brazil's foreign policy to uh, the experiences of Latin America, the experiences of some other countries in the global south, and especially with the rise of the far right, with this uh, populist, conservative, authoritarian, far-right wave that we have seen in the last couple of years. I've also dedicated my research to uh, what makes Brazil, uh, Brazil's far-right unique, what makes Bolsonaro so similar and yet so different from Trump, from uh, Orban in Hungary, from Duterte in the Philippines, and so on and so forth. So we're going to talk about those things as well um, when I zoom in on, on Bolsonaro. But let me start with a, a very simple definition here. I'm not sure. Uh, um, I was told by, by Elisa that uh, I have students from all walks of life, everywhere in the world, many different backgrounds. So I feel like I have to uh, offer you a very simple conceptual discussion a very introductory discussion on what foreign policy is about. So uh, let me start with the, the basics. Uh, even though I'm a political scientist by training, my bachelor's degree was in international relations. And this is one of the first things that we study as we get to the international relations uh, undergrad. Um, there are basically three major areas of study in international relations, and those are uh, transnational relations, um, which has to do with relations between multinational companies, big and small firms, um, NGOs, and civil society actors um, in, in a sort of network across the world. We have international politics, which is an area dedicated to the relations between countries. Um, in, 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 in countries alone. So it's basically the relationship, the, 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 the big power relationship uh, 
uh, between the United States and China and Russia and Ukraine and, and the wars and the military aspect of it. And foreign policy is uh, more of an inside out perspective on international relations. Because uh, when we uh, dedicate ourselves to foreign policy studies, we are trying to understand the nuts and bolts of foreign policy making from a domestic perspective and of course, its consequences um, to uh, how the country behaves uh, internationally. So foreign policy brings us this very interesting nexus between the domestic and the international. We have to understand the domestic forces, the domestic constraints, the economic imperatives, the political dynamics of a country, so that we can fully understand how this country behaves um, in the world. So this is pretty much what I have dedicated uh, myself uh, as a researcher in the last uh, decade. So foreign policy is a very noble uh, area of international relations because it lies at a crossroads between political science and international relations. So that's the reason why it makes it so interesting. And um, as a, a very simple, a very uh, a brief definition of foreign policy, I could tell you that uh, a, a foreign policy is a, a kind of a very special kind of public policy that tries to connect domestic demands with uh, international possibilities. There is a, a very uh, well known professor an international legal scholar in Brazil called Celso Laffer. He, he was the Minister of Foreign Affairs in the 1990s and then back in the 2000s. And he defines foreign policy as the combination between uh, domestic needs or internal needs and international possibilities. So foreign policy is uh, a kind of public policy uh, put forth by governments in an attempt to live up to domestic demands in the context of interaction with the rest of the world. So that's pretty much how I would define foreign policy right here. And there are some things that I need to say about this. The first thing, the most obvious thing is foreign policy is a government policy. So in the context of separation of branches of power of any democracy, Foreign policy is generally conducted by the executive branch of government. The legislative may interfere sometimes, the legislative uh, might have veto power, the legislative might have some mechanisms of controlling foreign policy, but it's primarily a government business. And as a government business, it can be understood or it can be divided into three different yet interconnected realms. The first and perhaps the most, uh, the best known realm of foreign policy is the political diplomatic realm. So pretty much what countries do abroad uh, will somehow connect to their political behavior. So countries, they, I mean, leaders shake hands, leaders negotiate treaties, leaders um, try to reach consensus regarding some multilateral issues. So uh, whenever we study foreign policy, the first aspect that comes to mind is this political diplomatic uh, aspect of uh, going to the world with a very clear political agenda and trying to negotiate this agenda for the benefit of the domestic uh, interests. But foreign policy is also uh, about military relations or strategic military relations. Um, this is something that most Brazilians overlook because Brazil is not particularly a, a militarized country. We are a very violent country for other reasons, but uh, we haven't been uh, at war with pretty much anyone for the last 150 years. And Brazil is about to turn 200 years old. So uh, 
for most of our existence as an independent country, we haven't fought wars. So that's the reason why the military aspect of Brazil's foreign policy is usually uh, overlooked or downplayed, right? Um, on the other hand, maybe we, we, we have to look at the military aspect of a foreign policy from the perspective of border relations. Because even though Brazil is a very peaceful country, Brazil is a country with borders, a very, very long uh, borders with many different countries. We have, we share borders with, if I'm not mistaken, nine countries. So um, this is also something to take into account. Even though we, we, we haven't militarized those relations along the border, sometimes, and especially nowadays with organized crime networks, drugs coming in, we, uh, we have re-emphasized the military aspect, but from a purely border perspective. And finally, uh, foreign policy is also about the economy. Um, that might sound obvious to uh, some of you, especially coming from liberal countries, like European countries or the United States or Canada, um, and of course, China, uh, ever more so. But if you think about uh, Brazil as an agrarian exporting country, as an agro exporting country for most of its existence, uh, the agro business sector has historically been private. So there was little to no relationship between the agro business sector and the government proper, which meant that foreign policy didn't really interfere with the businesses of private companies trying to export soybeans or coffee or sugarcane. Now, in the context of globalization, I mean, in the last 30 years or so, the economic financial aspect of foreign policy has become more and more salient. Um, in the context of Brazil, of course. It's no news to many countries out there, but in the case of Brazil, that's been a recent movement of incorporating economic financial issues as part of the core concerns of foreign policy. And of course, um, all of these arenas where foreign policy is played out somehow relate to the domestic demands of the country. So we have... Uh, a very strong agro-business sector, and that's the reason why we're going to emphasize the, the need to liberalize agriculture in the World Trade Organization, for example. We have a very strong uh, military corporation, uh, which might uh, lead us to the need of militarizing our relations with the rest of the world even further, or buying weapons or selling weapons, depending on the circumstances. We have uh, a growing evangelical Christian population in Brazil, which might somehow change the way we relate to religion abroad. So uh, transformations at home will naturally lead to some changes abroad. This is something that I need to emphasize because foreign policy is very dynamic, as you can imagine. So changes at home will necessarily imply some transformations um, in the way the country behaves towards the rest of the world. Now, um, even though the concept of foreign policy applies to pretty much every country out there, there's something unique about Brazil. And I want to emphasize this uniqueness so that you can understand Brazil's project of, of nation or Brazil's project of becoming an emerging power at some point in the early 2000s. Uh, there are a few things to underline about Brazil's uh, foreign policy uniqueness. The first thing is, uh, as I said before, uh, Brazil has uh, uh, placed an emphasis on the political diplomatic aspect of foreign policy to the detriment of the strategic military and the economic financial arenas, um, which allows us to treat foreign policy and diplomacy as synonyms in Portuguese, 
in Brazilian Portuguese, to be more specific. Um, if you look it up in the dictionary, foreign policy and diplomacy are fundamentally different things. Diplomacy is a tool, an instrument of foreign policy. Diplomats make foreign policy, but other people also make foreign policy. Bureaucrats, politicians, and so on and so forth. But in the case of Brazil, because of a very peculiar historical circumstance, foreign policy has almost entirely been made throughout history by diplomats, which allows us to equate the two things, foreign policy and diplomacy as pretty much the same thing in Brazil. Now, this has a very important consequence. And let me uh, underline the consequence right here. As you can see, I've erased the domestic demands uh, uh, subtitle right here. I'm taking it out of my equation because if we're talking about foreign policy as an exclusively political diplomat diplomatic realm, people have a little say about it or no say at all. So that's the reason why I um, took domestic demands uh, away from the equation. And I'm going to, to explore this a little bit further. Now, there are a few other things that I want to underline uh, aside from uh, what I've just said. Um, because foreign policy in Brazil has primarily revolved around the political diplomatic realm, diplomats have always had the upper hand in shaping and making foreign policy in this country. We might call this, um, and pardon the uh, inaccurateness, but we can call it the virtual monopoly of foreign policy making by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Brazil. We have a shorthand for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Brazil, which is Itamaraty. That might sound weird for foreigners, Sometimes they can't pronounce it, but Itamaraty is the name we give to the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Affairs or Foreign Relations, right? In other words, the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Relations, backed up by a very strong and hierarchical diplomatic career, has virtually monopolized foreign policymaking ever since the good old times of the Brazilian Empire. You guys have learned a little bit of history, right? So Brazil was an empire for most of the 19th century. And Brazil only became a republic in 1889. But since the times of the empire, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has played a very important and a very central role in shaping foreign policy. And then, of course, you might just ask me, um, isn't it the case for pretty much every single country in the world? And the answer is no. Um, the bureaucracy of foreign policy making is usually uh, weak. It usually changes as governments change. Uh, you see, when Trump took office in the United States back in 2017, he basically destroyed the Foreign Service, the State Department's Foreign Service because he wanted to appoint people uh, that he trusted uh, outside of the bureaucracy. This is something that doesn't really happen in Brazil. The logic of foreign policy has always been uh, uh, defined and, and, and played out by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And as I said, by a very hierarchical, professional and, and insulated bureaucracy. So we, we have a, something very peculiar about Brazil in this, in this regard. Um, and of course, the question that, ar that arises from this is, uh, why is that the case? Why, has, why does Brazil have such a strong diplomatic uh, structure? And the answer is right here. Um, there is this book written by uh, former minister and ambassador, Rubin Sicupero, he's one, of, he's, one of, he's one of Brazil's leading diplomats, uh, one of the most popular diplomats alive. 
And he wrote this wonderful book called uh, Brazil, um, sorry, Diplomacy in the Construction of Brazil, in which he tells the story of diplomacy in Brazil even before Brazil became independent. So from the mid 18th century, all the way through 2016, that's when he ends the book, he uh, creates, a, he constructs a narrative according to which diplomacy has been the single most important actor in shaping Brazil's borders, in shaping Brazil's international identity, and in shaping Brazil's political relations with the rest of the world. I mentioned borders, and this is something very interesting to underline. If you go back in time, I'm not going to bore you with this, but if you go back in time and think about how states are formed, most states are formed through wars. The United States was formed in its uh, very large territory uh, through several wars across the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. Most European nations were formed through wars. And some of these wars were world wars at some point. The Brazilian case is quite different because even though Brazil is the fifth largest country in the world, none of its borders were defined through wars. Well, how were they defined then? And the answer is, the borders of Brazil, pretty much the, the contours of what you understand as Brazil today were shaped entirely by international treaties. You guys have probably heard of the Treaty of Tordesillas dating back to 1494. That was the first treaty that shaped at least a little piece of Brazil. And then the Treaty of Madrid in 1750. And then the Treaty of Petropolis in the in the early 20th century. So basically, um, uh, uh, three or four treaties over the course of time have pretty much shaped who we are as a territorial entity. And, and, and this is, of course, not trivial. This is very important because diplomats are able to tell the story of the construction of Brazil through the hands of diplomacy. And of course, Diplomacy has also guaranteed Brazil's unscathed international image, even in times of looming crisis in the country. So Brazil was going through a lot of tension, a lot of problems, military coups at the time, military revolts, but Brazil's position in the world remained untouched. This is also thanks to diplomacy. So Ricupero, the author of this book, makes a very bold case of diplomacy as the most important driving force of Brazil's stability and power as a country. I'm not talking about the military. I'm not talking about politicians. I'm not talking about revolutionaries. I'm talking about diplomats who tend to behave and to be very unique in the way they relate with politics, for example. They have a lower profile. They are very well trained in languages. They, they have a very uh, elitist background. So Brazil, even though we are a, a poor country, we are a, a developing nation with lots of inequality, for example, uh, the construction of Brazil's presence in the world was pretty much played out by diplomats. And among the diplomats, among all diplomats that have played the role in shaping Brazil's uh, identity, there's one who happens to have become a, a kind of national hero in Brazil. And this man is called uh, Barão do Rio Branco, the Baron of Rio Branco or White River, <laughs> if you want a direct translation. So uh, the Baron of Rio Branco, he, he was um, one of the Republic's earliest foreign ministers. He, uh, he conducted, he led the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from 1902 to 1912. So for the whole 
20th century. He was the longest serving foreign minister in the history of this country. And it was thanks to him that Brazil came up with a very solid, a very respectable set of values and principles that the country stands up for uh, in the world. So Rio Branco is usually considered the, the most important figure in Brazilian diplomacy because, uh, well, because of uh, several things. He negotiated the treaty that gave the final contours to Brazil, but he also set out the values and the principles that still today guide Brazil's foreign policy, right? And everyone, every single diplomat, every single student in high school happens to know who Rio Branco uh, was. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs is often called uh, the House of Rio Branco, right? The Institute, the Diplomatic Institute of Brazil is the Rio Branco Institute. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, prominence to this figure, uh, not to mention the fact that um, up until 30 years ago, Rio Branco uh, was stamped on the, 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 the bills, the money bills in Brazil, the Baron uh, equaled uh, a thousand units of whatever. Um, and that's the reason why sometimes when we refer, especially the, the, the older generations, when we refer to a thousand something, a thousand units of money in Brazil, sometimes we refer to it as one baron, one baron. Um, and that gives us the measure of how important this man uh, was. And now, of course, you might just ask me, uh, what kind of values did he stand up for? I mean, what's the, what's the importance of Rio Branco in, in more concrete terms? And the importance is right here. If we look at the trajectory of our diplomacy, we can see a lot of continuity, a lot of consistency, a lot of coherence in our foreign policy, thanks to what Rio Branco has uh, defined or defined back in the uh, early 20th century. So we can divide foreign policy in three different uh, uh, dimensions, if I may. There's the dimension of the goals of Brazil's foreign policy, the principles and the strategies. And when it comes to, to the goals of Brazil's foreign policy, it was Rio Branco back in the early 20th century who said, that the most important thing to Brazil was to be recognized as a strong, as a reliable, as a reputable country abroad. Rio Branco played out what we call the politics of prestige. And prestige, as we all know, turns out to be very important for countries, especially for middle-sized countries who do not have enough material power to, uh, to, to, to move up uh, in the international, on the international stage. If, we, um, if a country wants to be relevant, if a country wants to have its voice heard, um, it either has uh, a nuclear weapon, uh, and some countries have gone nuclear <laughs> because they understood the role of uh, uh, the military uh, uh, power in foreign policy, but some countries can just uh, become prestigious. And that's exactly the, the, the path Brazil took since the early 19th century, prestige as the ultimate goal of Brazil's foreign policy. Of course, um, I'm going to cut a very long story short. Uh, prestige is not enough, especially in, in the context of economic crises. So Brazil had a lot of prestige, for example, in the early 20th century, but Brazil's economy uh, went bankrupt eventually. So um, I'd say that up until this very day, uh, more than 100 years after Rio Branco's passing, uh, Brazil's foreign policy is guided by a combination of prestige on the one hand 
and the search for development, on the other hand. Many presidents, including the one who lends his name to the, to the, the university I work at, uh, Getulio Vargas, um, they, they have established this combination between prestige and development as Brazil's foreign policy uh, end game, Brazil's foreign policy uh, goal. So foreign policy uh, has ended up becoming uh, an instrument for Brazil's development, an instrument for industrialization back in the 1930s and 40s, an instrument for uh, exports in the 1970s and 80s, an instrument for uh, inserting, placing Brazil in the context of globalization back in the 2000s and so on and so forth. So whenever you think of foreign policy in Brazil, you have think, to think about this combination of prestige and development, right? And in the back of the minds of Brazilian diplomats, one thing doesn't happen without the other. You cannot have prestige if you're not developed enough, and you cannot really develop if you don't have prestige, right? So it's a, it's a two-way thing. Now, the most important thing about Rio Branco's legacy in, in foreign policy uh, has to do with the principles. You see, um, I'm not sure if I can translate this literally, but Brazil is a, a, a principle-driven country in international affairs. Um, in Portuguese, we sometimes call it principista. I'm not sure if that's, that's the right word, uh, like a principist, principalist in English, but, uh, but that's the thing. Brazil is a principle-driven country in foreign affairs, um, which basically, makes Brazil a very uh, unique country too in the way it behaves in the world. Because most countries out there are either guided by power, power considerations such as, well, I'm, I'm going to be friends with this country or with the other country because I need to increase my power in the world. So that, that's a, a very simple calculation. Or they're guided by ideology. So ideology and power are the two main drivers of any country's foreign policy. Uh, Brazil is slightly different because irrespective of the domestic ideology of a given government, a given administration, Brazil has always stood up for the same principles internationally. And of course, um, we cannot be naive to think that Brazil has no power considerations too, but principles always come first, always come before power, at least in the way we shape the narrative of our presence in the world. And of course, the question is, what principles do Brazil, does Brazil um, stand up for? It's basically three sets of principles. The first one is a very strong, unconditional defense of sovereignty as the guiding principle of foreign affairs. Brazil doesn't give up on its sovereignty. Brazil doesn't accept countries uh, interfering with other countries' sovereignty uh, or sovereign status, which sometimes translates into non-intervention. So Brazil is a very firm advocate of non-intervention. The second aspect is multilateralism. Brazil always prefers to solve problems collectively rather than, than to do it uh, bilaterally or even unilaterally. And third, Brazil is a firm believer in the peaceful resolution of conflicts. If, if there's a diplomatic exit for a conflict, if there's a diplomatic solution for something, Brazil will always uh, privilege the peaceful resolution uh, before the military intervention, for example, before the war uh, as a solution and so on and so forth. And it comes as no surprise that Brazil has always been against wars. Whenever there's a war out there, the United States invading Iraq 2003, Russia invading Ukraine 2022, Brazil is 
at least in, in, in rhetoric, against it. And Brazil won't take part as a belligerent, uh, as a belligerent actor. Um, and the third aspect, the third dimension or layer of Brazil's foreign policy has to do with the strategies. The strategies is, uh, I mean, in very simple terms, how does Brazil get or how can Brazil get to the goals it has set in the first place? So if Brazil wants to be recognized as a relevant player, if Brazil wants to develop itself as a country, what paths should Brazil take? And historically, we have also been very consistent when it came to our strategies. We've had two across the 20th century. The first one was Americanism. And of course, because we live in a hemisphere with a superpower called the United States of America, Brazil has, ever since the early 20th century, opted to uh, follow the United States lead, right? So Americanism has been one of the most important positions of Brazil's foreign policy for at least the first half of the 20th century. That was, of course, not unconditional, but that was a very strong position. Now, as Brazil became stronger, as Brazil became more self-reliant, as Brazil became more autonomous, Brazil has changed strategies from a, a strategy of uh, being friends with the United States or being an ally of the United States. Brazil has decided to adopt or to embrace a more universalist approach to international affairs. That started back in the 1960s and continues up until this very day. Uh, in the good old days of the Cold War, we used to call it third worldism because it was, of course, Brazil moving away from the United States. It didn't want to move towards the Soviet Union. So basically, Brazil was looking towards the, the rest of the world, Africa, Middle East, uh, and so on and so forth, China. Um, but especially after the end of the Cold War, it, it, it no longer makes sense to speak of third worldism. Uh, so we'd just rather call it universalism. Universalism is a strategy where the best strategy for Brazil is to be friends with pretty much everybody out there, to do trade with pretty much everybody out there, to have good political relations with everyone, no strings attached, no ideologies involved, in a very pragmatic fashion, and so on and so forth. So in a nutshell, Brazil has, uh, throughout the 20th century, shifted between Americanism and global and universalism. That's, the, that's a very uh, summarized approach to, to Brazil's uh, foreign policy. Now, um, whenever you speak of the 20th century, it's already back in the past, right? So we have to think about Brazil and any occasional changes in Brazil's foreign policy in the last three or four decades. I'm not sure if anyone has already told you this, but uh, back in 1985, we became a democracy all over again. We spent 21 years uh, under a military dictatorship, and then we came back uh, to be a democracy uh, as of 1985. And that's the moment we have inaugurated the new republic, Nova Republica. That's the expression that we use to describe everything that has happened ever since uh, 1985. And I pretty much like this picture, by the way, because it depicts the four, the five, sorry, living presidents of Brazil since the new republic started in 1985. Uh, now we have two more, Temer and Bolsonaro. But um, I, I just wanted to give you a, a, a taste of uh, what, what politics in Brazil looked like up until uh, recently. Now, the question that arises, um, especially because we're talking about a post-Cold War and democratic setting in Brazil, is, um, did anything change since 1985? 
uh, does Brazil have a different foreign policy from what it used to be uh, throughout the 20th century, for example? And the answer is yes, at least in terms, but not entirely. Because as I said before, diplomacy has always played a very important role. Diplomacy has exerted a, 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 a gravity center, right? In Brazil's foreign policy in such a way that even in a very democratic and open context, uh, Brazil's foreign policy has preserved some of the elements that we saw uh, from back uh, in, in the 20th century. Now, the two big differences that we see in Brazil's foreign policy ever since 1985 are, number one, redemocratization. Brazil has gone through a process of political opening, uh, which is great news, by the way. Brazil is certainly uh, a, a democracy today. Uh, it wasn't for most of the 20th century. Um, but also, together with the political opening, we also witnessed between the 1980s and 1990s, a process of economic opening that has a lot to do with the very process of globalization in the world. So Brazil had to deal with uh, a, a never more globalized economy. And that was very difficult for Brazil, by the way, because we, we, we have historically been a very close country in terms of trade with the rest of the world, in terms of investments. So um, Brazil had to deal with uh, both circumstances all at a time, political and economic liberalization have uh, changed Brazil's foreign policy to some degree. And that allows us to reinterpret that three layer model that I've just shown you. Um, as I said before, we have pretty much preserved the basic elements of foreign policy from the 20th century, but there are some changes. And let me talk about these changes for uh, one minute. First of all, when it comes to the goals, prestige and development are still at the core of Brazil's foreign policy goals. But now, because we live in a democracy, prestige, has become very much connected to the role of the president in foreign policy. That was not the case for most of the 20th century. If you asked uh, any foreign interlocutors, they wouldn't be able to tell the name of Brazilian presidents. For most of the 20th century, it was not a meaningful thing. People knew Brazil. People heard a lot about Rio, about Samba, about Bolsa Nova, but they didn't really know the president's names. But now, in the context of globalization, uh, I think everyone knows who Bolsonaro is. Um, I mean, whoever reads the news uh, in the world knows who Bolsonaro is um, as much as people used to know who Lula was as, uh, as he was the president of Brazil back in the early 2000s. So prestige today is not so much a diplomatic business as it has become a presidential business, which means that presidents, they, they attach their own reputation to the country's reputation abroad, which is sometimes great, but it can also be a curse. You see, <laughs> what we're going through today is more of the, the curse aspect of it because many people confuse the president with the country and its people, even though it's not the same. Now, development is also there. And development, of course, has a lot to do with globalization, with how the world uh, has become much more interdependent, much more interconnected, much more uh, globalized. And of course, Brazil has, um, has to adapt its strategies to, uh, to a globalized uh, world. Um, I, I've seen a, a, a question here by Yuta. I'm, I'm going to answer this question in, in a minute. Let me just finish this and then I move on to the question. Now, when it comes to the principles, as you can see, Brazil has uh, maintained the very same principles from the early 20th century, sovereignty, 
multilateralism and pacifism. Now, uh, there are two differences here that I want to underline. First of all, sovereignty was replaced by autonomy. And I think it's important because the very idea of sovereignty today is not as rigid as it used to be. If you look back in the history of the 1960s, everyone was talking about sovereignty as an absolute thing, but especially in the context of globalization, it's very hard to speak of sovereignty uh, as, uh, a a as a very solid uh, institution. So that's the reason why sometimes we prefer to refer to uh, sovereignty as autonomy. Autonomy gives a country leverage or room to maneuver, uh, even though sovereignty might not be an absolute thing uh, in some specific circumstances. And there is another principle here, and this is interesting. Remember that I told you that the basic strategies of Brazil foreign Brazil's foreign policy for most of the 20th century were Americanism and universalism. Uh, as the 21st century approached, we saw something interesting taking place. Universalism ceased to be a strategy and became a principle on its own, which means that nowadays we no longer live a dilemma between taking sides with the United States or being friends with the rest of the world. Our position, our ethical and, and principle-based position in the world is we believe that the more partners we have, the better. We believe that we have to be friends with everyone. We believe that we should not condemn or isolate a country in the world because by doing so, it only becomes more radical and more authoritarian. And that has made Brazil open up embassies in countries like North Korea or Afghanistan. So the reason why we want to be friends, we want to have diplomatic relations with those countries is grounded on the principle of universalism. Now, if universalism has ceased to be a strategy and became a principle, what are the strategies that we adopt today in our foreign policy? There are three basic strategies that we have adopted since the beginning of the new republic. The first one is integration. Uh, some authors call it autonomy through integration, which basically means that one of the most important elements of our foreign policy is to look towards our neighbors and to integrate with our neighbors. The most important aspect of it, Mercosur, the, the trade block between Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela suspended, but used to be there, Paraguay and Uruguay. The second strategy that we have uh, also adopted is called participation. And that relates to multilateral fora, such as the United Nations or the World Trade Organization. We, we hold the belief that the more activist Brazil is, in multilateral spaces, such as the United Nations or the World Trade Organization, the better for Brazil, which means that we can also attain autonomy through participating uh, regularly and consistently in multilateral spaces. And the third and final strategy is diversification. Um, once again, it rests on the premise that Brazil benefits from being friends with as many countries as it can. And that means that Brazil wants, always wants to diversify its array of partnerships. African countries, Middle Eastern countries, Central Asian countries, you name it, Latin American countries, of course. So basically the notion of diversification has been um, a very strong element of Lula's and, and Rousseff's foreign policy in the last few years. Just to illustrate the, the three strategies, we can, oh, sorry, we can see it. Um, oh, by the way, it's in Portuguese, but never mind that. If you look at our constitution, Article 4 of our constitution, 
enshrines pretty much every single principle that has guided our foreign policy ever since the 20th century. But let me just illustrate. This is the picture of the foundation of Mercosur back in 1991. Our president was a neoliberal president called Fernando Collor. Um, ideologies aside, he understood the importance of integrating with the neighbors. Cardozo was our president in the mid to late 1990s, early 2000s, a very popular president at the time. And he understood the, the importance of participating actively of United Nations discussions. Lula, who was our president between 2003 and 2010, has uh, traveled, I mean, he traveled during his time in office to more than a hundred different places in the world. And everywhere he went, he was uh, cherished. He was uh, celebrated as uh, a very important global leader, right? So I, I see all of these attitudes uh, along a continuum, right? It's not about Lula or Cardozo or Collar alone, but it's about how they understood uh, foreign policy as an integral part of Brazil's uh, reputation in the world. Now, let me zoom in on the recent developments of Brazil's foreign policy. So I want to use perhaps 20 minutes to do it, and then we can open up to, to questions. Oh, let me answer a question first, by the way, since um, Yuta uh, has asked me a question. So let me answer this question right now. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna read the question, right? Because there's an introduction, you can see uh, it on the chat box. Uh, can he be consider, considered as an exception of the principle of valuing sovereignty, uh, the, the, the Mercosur arrangement, or in the area of economic foreign policy, the principle of multilateralism is more, more valued than its sovereignty? Um, I might have already answered the question, but let me just uh, underline it once again. Uh, especially after the end of the Cold War and with the advent of globalization, we have, uh, we have made sovereignty a little bit more flexible in terms of principles. As I said before, if you go back to the 1960s, people were talking about sovereignty in very absolute ways. I want to industrialize my country. I, I, I don't want to integrate with anyone. I want to be self-sufficient in pretty much everything. I want to be politically closed. I don't, know, uh, I don't want to be influenced by anyone out there. So this very strong and absolute idea of sovereignty no longer exists, except for North Korea, maybe. But if you look at the rest of the world, they have all flexibilized. Uh, is flexibilized the word, I don't know, but they, they've made sovereignty flexible as a concept, right? Uh, because multilateralism turns out to be a very important thing. You, you cannot solve some multilateral issues without resorting to some uh, sovereignty relativization. So you cannot discuss environment, you cannot discuss trade, you cannot discuss human rights without... Uh, an understanding, a more cosmopolitan understanding of sovereignty. Um, in Mercosur, of course, uh, it was created in 1991. So it's a byproduct of globalization. So Mercosur, uh, even though it has gone through different stages over the last uh, decades, Mercosur is a good example of um, a, a sovereignty flexibilizing mechanism, if I can put it this way. Um, and I see no problem in that. And of course, uh, if you look at Bolsonaro's foreign policy today, he's going to criticize Mercosur precisely because it doesn't allow Brazil to do uh, trade with other countries without uh, agreeing in, in, within Mercosur first. So there has been a criticism of Mercosur on the grounds that it 
reduces Brazilian sovereignty in dealing with the rest of the world from a trade perspective. But I think that um, this is all rhetoric. If we look at the practice of world foreign policy, it has accepted some degree of foreign policy uh, flexibility uh, for the benefit of cooperation and multilateralism and to advance some economic goals and so on and so forth. Now, let me also talk about a very cool thing about Brazil, which also makes us unique somehow. Um, you have probably noticed by now from the lectures that you've had from the experience in Brazil, that Brazil is a very diverse country. And one of the things that makes Brazil beautiful as a country and as a society is the fact that we bear multiple identities, right? We are at the same time, Lucian, I'm not sure if you agree with me, but we are at the same time a Western country because we have so many elements that makes, uh, make us Western, such as the Catholic faith or the political institutions, the very colonization uh, process. Um, but we are a very unique form of West because we are located in South America or in Latin America more broadly. So we are Western, but we are Latinos too. And, and that makes Brazil, um, well, and so is Colombia or Mexico. So uh, that doesn't really distinguish us. But I'd say that of all, Latin, of all Latin American countries, Brazil is probably, together with Argentina, the two countries that have emphasized their Western identities for, for longer, especially in the 20th century or even before. Um, and aside from being South American and, and Western, we're also part of the global South. We're also a developing country. We are also poor, to put it in, in, in other terms. Uh, and, and that means that Brazil has a great transit across global South countries, across Latin American countries, and across Western countries because of different elements of who we are. Right, India. Just to give you uh, some some comparisons, India. It's a global South country. It's a South Asian country. Uh, it's also very diverse, as much as Brazil. But it's much harder for Indians to convince the world that they belong to the West because of its history, because of its civilizational background, and so on and so forth. So it can say a lot of things about itself. But it's very hard to make a case for India as part of the West. It's easier for us. Even though uh, whenever we talk to foreigners, sometimes they raise an eyebrow when we say we are a Western country. Uh, no, you're not. Come on. You're, you're just like Latino. But I, I think that there's a, there's a tension right there that allows us to move uh, across identities. Um, and those identities, at least from what I understand, they are not mutually excluding, which means that we can use different identities at different times without contradicting each other. In other words, Brazil has made use of many different hats in its foreign policy. Whenever we want to emphasize the role of integration, we, we wear the South American slash Latin American hat. Uh, whenever we want to emphasize the historical connection that we have with the Middle East or with Africa, we wear the global South hat. Um, and because we have a massive African diaspora here, a, a huge Lebanese and Arab diaspora as well. Um, and the same goes for the West. We can wear the Western hat whenever we want to discuss human rights or the environment, because these are issues that bring us closer to countries like European countries or the United States. So it's precisely the multiple identity structure that we have together with the, the long trajectory of foreign policy that allows us to be very, um, very dynamic on the world stage. Now, let me zoom in, as I said, on the recent administrations. Let's start with Lula. Lula, uh, uh, who's a, a, presidential, um, a presidential candidate right now, uh, 
Lula presided over Brazil between 2003 and 2010. And that was the moment where Brazil reached its, its foreign policy apex. That was the moment Brazil was regarded by the rest of the world as an emerging power, as the country of the future or something along these lines. You see, uh, even the most liberal of weekly magazines, The Economist, published uh, a front page article on Brazil taking off. That was 2009. Everybody was so excited about the perspective of having Brazil in the, in the great power, in the big power concert. And of course, Lula was very happy about it. Brazil was moving very quickly towards becoming one of the most relevant countries in the world, not only trade-wise, but also politically speaking and, and in multilateral uh, fora as well. Now, uh, many people say that Lula uh, played out uh, a very irresponsible and reckless kind of foreign policy. I even wrote about it together with a, a UFMG professor, uh, Davison Lopes. We, 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 we discussed this, um, this aspect, this uh, grandiose aspect of Lula's foreign policy. Um, on, on a very critical uh, lens, but I'd say that Lula was only trying to live up to something that Brazilians have always expected. And it's curious because if you go back to the 19th century, you're gonna see politicians and academics and, and writers, everyone was uh, longing for Brazil to become a great power at some point. So in other words, greatness is in our historical DNA. Um, for some of you, if some of you know Portuguese, I really recommend you read the, the lyrics to the national anthem, for example, because it talks about grand grandiosity. It talks about Brazil being a special country uh, among the concert of nations. So Lula, um, his foreign policy was uh, uh, so cherished by people at home and of course by interlocutors abroad because for the first time ever, Brazil was finally living up to the collective expectation of Brazil becoming a great power. Now, uh, would it have happened under any other president? Yes, maybe. Lula was particularly charismatic, so he was somebody who really wanted to uh, deposit his own prestige into foreign policy uh, endeavors. But we have to look at the context. And I must say that the context of the early 2000s was very favorable for Brazil. Let's look first at the global conditions of the world back in the early 2000s. First of all, we were witnessing a, 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 a collective rise of emerging countries or emerging markets, if I may. The world was walking, albeit slowly, towards multipolarity. I can give you an example just to illustrate the first BRICS report published by a, a published by Goldman Sachs by chief economist Jim O'Neill was published in 2001. So 2001 was the first time Brazil, Russia, India, and China were mentioned together as the economies of the future. So that was the context. And of course, this context, the context was greatly improved by the commodity boom of the early 2000s. So many export-led economies, Brazil included, benefited greatly from uh, a, a rise in commodity prices, for example. Brazil is uh, an exporter of uh, iron ore, uh, soybeans, beef, oil, 
So these things combined made Brazil uh, grow exponentially uh, throughout the first uh, decade of the 2000s. And of course, uh, on a global scale, we were also witnessing the demise of US unilateral policies in some parts of the world, especially in, in, in the Middle East and Latin America. The century started with the 9-11 attacks, 2001. The United States immediately invaded Afghanistan. One and a half year later, they invaded Iraq. And then the criticism began. And of course, the United States has also weakened after long years in, in the quagmire of Iraq. So that's the reason why we speak, especially after the, in the second half of the 2000s, the demise of US unilateralism. But we also have to pay attention to the domestic context of Brazil. For the first time in a long time, we were enjoying political and economic stability. The Lula administration, however controversial, it wasn't affected by uh, specific crises. Lula had a very successful economic policy. Um, some, some authors even call it the uh, Lula's R R Real Plan. Uh, I'm not sure if you know it, but the Real Plan was the hyperinflation control plan played out in the early 1990s that, that has stabilized our economy for good. And Lula, of course, built upon the stabilization of the economy to expand credit, to increase real wages, and to redistribute the income. And that was great. Cash transfer policies, you name it. So there were a lot of good things about Lula's economic policy. Uh, some went wrong at some point, but uh, they were altogether uh, seen as very positive to allow for greater prosperity in Brazil. Many people went out of hunger, went out of poverty. So uh, the middle class increased dramatically. So those are all good news for Brazil. And most, important, most importantly, Lula is an inet negotiator. So he could put together an alliance of classes. Many people thought that Lula would uh, play out a socialist kind of political uh, regime, and that's not what happened. Businesses, banks, and workers joined forces for most of Lula's time in office in projecting Brazil in the world. So there seemed to be at some point a widespread consensus of uh, how Brazil was becoming a global player and, and, and the, 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 the fate, the destiny of Brazil in the world. So I, I'd say that this, this crossed boundaries of classes in Brazil, at least for uh, Lula's time in office. I could describe Lula's foreign policy uh, in three Ds. On the bilateral level, when it comes to the relationship between Brazil and the rest of the world, it was a policy of diversification. The Brazilian government opened up no less than 30 embassies during Lula's time in office. 30 embassies, mostly in Africa, the Middle East, and some parts of Asia. Brazil has increased trade relations with pretty much every single country out there. Brazil has adopted the strategy of fostering technical cooperation policies with African countries. Uh, Brazil even attempted to mediate some Middle Eastern uh, conflicts such as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and Iran's uh, nuclear deal. Some of these moves were highly controversial too, but diversification is the idea to define Lula's foreign policy. On the regional level, the key word is development. Um, Brazil's international growth has also caused a lot of jealousy in the world, especially in the region. We have to put it in context very briefly. Brazil has 50% of the total South American area. Brazil has 50% of the region's GDP. Brazil has more than 70% of the region's investments, which means that every single neighbor is much smaller than Brazil and therefore uh, jealous of where Brazil's getting. And I'm not saying this uh, 
in a derogatory fashion. I'm just stating a geopolitical and geoeconomic fact. Brazil's size and power is an obstacle for relations with the neighbors. And that's the reason why Brazil's foreign policy decided to invest a lot in developing the neighbors through infrastructure projects, through technical cooperation, through increasing trade. Brazil has decided to act as South America's Germany, to put it in, in these terms. Brazil became the paymaster of South America as much as Germany uh, is the paymaster of the European Union. Um, the third and, and, and final aspect of Lula's foreign policy is democratization. And that's the, that's the strategy of Lula's foreign policy on the multilateral stage. And democratization here uh, means that Brazil and some other emerging countries like China and India and Russia were trying to open up more spaces to have their voices heard in multilateral forum. So one of the things that you would hear more often um, among Brazilian diplomats was Security Council of the United Nations reform, the International Monetary Fund reform, the World Bank reform, the World Trade Organization reform. Why did Brazil wanted to want to reform so many international organizations? Because it wanted more protagonism because they wanted to be uh, more, more active. Um, I didn't get to translate these, so I'm going to make them available for you. Um, this is just a, a scheme, a very complex scheme, by the way, of the many initiatives played out by the Lula administration when it came to foreign policy. So many things happened. I have no time to talk about each one of them, but... Um, you just have to have an idea that by the end of Lula's two terms in office, he was considered as the United Nations next secretary general. People were talking about this possibility. He left office with an 83% approval rating. That was massive. Of course, we might just look back and understand that some of his policies were short-lived, some of his policies were really irresponsible, some of his policies didn't work out or had no sustainability in the long run. But I think it's fair to say that Lula, uh, for his eight years in office, was a political, a genuine political phenomenon. Um, and there was so much so that he was able to elect his direct successor. And that was a complicated business back in the day because uh, President Rousseff, President Juma Rousseff, uh, who's from Belo Horizonte, by the way, she uh, didn't have the same political traits, the same political abilities as, as Lula. So many people criticize Rousseff as a, as, a, as a manufactured candidate, as a fake candidate. It was just to allow Lula to have a third and eventually a fourth term in office uh, without uh, subverting democracy. Uh, people compared Rousseff with uh, Dmitry Medvedev in Russia, for example, uh, as a, like a, 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 a makeshift candidate. But you see, uh, things didn't turn out as people expected, and, and Rousseff had a lot of personality. Um, it was not necessarily uh, uh, good, Sometimes he was uh, highly problematic. Um, but the, the, the fact of the matter, just to, to cut another story short, is that Rousseff didn't have the means or the will to make a foreign policy as grandiose as Lula's for his time in office. And by the means, I mean, she didn't have the resources. She didn't have, I mean, the context didn't help either. So basically it was a very different moment in the world and Brazil, of course, uh, paid the price for it. That's a, a, another cover from The Economist magazine. You see, that was 2013. And the question that people were asking themselves by 2013, four years after the publication of the first cover was, uh, had Brazil blown it 
And the answer was unfortunately yes. Brazil blew it <laughs> um, dramatically, especially after 2013. So let's put it in context again. If you look at the global conditions of the world, you see that they were not really favorable for Brazil. First of all, the post-2008 recession finally hit the emerging economies. Lula, back in the day in 2008, when the crisis struck the world, Lula was very proud to say that the crisis hadn't hit Brazil whatsoever. It was a tsunami in the rest of the world, but here, it was just like a, a tiny little wave. So Brazil was very uh, uh, confident that, that, that they would uh, uh, go through the crisis unscathed. And, and that was not the case. We only postponed the crisis for uh, some time later. So the post-2008 recession struck Brazil in 2012. <laughs> and that's the reason why inflation came around and instability came around and so on and so forth. Another important element in the context, in the global context, China became the world's second largest economy. Why is that important for Brazil? Well, it was important because Brazil was no longer playing the same game as China. In the, in the past decade, people believed that Brazil, India, Russia, and China were acting as a block of emerging economies. But in a few years, we finally understood that China was playing a very different game because it was not an emerging country. It was the world's second largest power. So it was hard to uh, place Brazil and Russia and India and China in the same basket. That of course made the BRICS a little bit less stable. Brazil had to adapt its, its strategies to deal with China, not as an equal, but as a, as a potential uh, imperialist power vis-a-vis -vis Brazil. So that became very complicated. And finally, remember the universalist strategy of Brazil of being friends with everyone, trying to mediate conflicts everywhere in the world. There was a new wave of conflict starting with the Arab Spring in the Middle East, but also in Africa, in Ukraine, uh, that really made it hard for Brazil to be super active when it came to international conflicts. Now, looking at the domestic circumstances of Brazil, Rousseff was going through terrible times. Her governing coalition was uh, imploding. It was becoming weak and unstable as time passed. She didn't have the same condition as Lula to govern without uh, political troubles. In 2013, we had a series of mass demonstrations, mass protests against the rise in inflation, corruption, and against the political establishment, by and large. Um, and these protests very quickly became anti-Rusev protests at some point. And they have also helped uh, Rusev to become further isolated and eventually to get impeached. And finally, the cherry on top of Rousseff's dire condition was the car wash operation that exposed corruption scandals involving the Workers' Party, Rousseff herself, Lula, and, the, and Brazil's oil giant Petrobras, and big businesses. And the car wash operation uh, basically paved the way for Rousseff's impeachment back in 2016, right? Of course, I'm oversimplifying the argument here, but the point is, Rousseff didn't have the same luck as Lula. She didn't have the same ability. She didn't have the same luck. She didn't have the same conditions. And that's the result. That's the outcome. You see, if you look at the global GDP growth of the world between 2010 and 2016, <clears throat> the world was growing at an average 3%. Brazil... was shrinking at some point. So Brazil had a zero economic growth in 2014, and Brazil had a negative 3.8% GDP growth in 2015 and a negative 3.1% in 2016. So basically, Brazil went, uh, went on, um, on official recession. Brazil's economy was shrinking. 
of course, it was not, uh, Juma wasn't to blame entirely for that. The context was terrible. The economy was faltering. The political circumstances didn't help. But of course, everyone who looked back in what the Rousseff administration meant economically blamed, blamed the whole economic problems on Rousseff. And that's the reason why she got impeached at the end of the day. She didn't really commit a crime, like a responsibility crime, um, but she was impeached for political reasons, mostly because she couldn't handle the economic downturns of the time. But of course, uh, when it comes to her strategy, of her foreign policy strategy, uh, even in a dire context, she could have performed better. She didn't really uh, uh, took the advantage of Brazil's very privileged position in the world to use foreign policy to contain or to reduce the economic effects of the recession. Her foreign policy was actually meager. If Lula had his own three Ds, diversification, development, and democratization, Dilma Rousseff had also had her three Ds. On the bilateral level, downturn. She basically ceased to relate to many of the good old partners that we used to have, including the United States. But in that case, America is to blame because of the uh, NSA scandal. The United States was spying on Brazil and Rousseff uh, wasn't happy about it, of course. But um, we didn't have as, as, as many partners as we used to have under Lula. On the regional level, uh, the logic was one of dogmatism. Rousseff was more ideological than Lula, that's for sure. I mean, uh, uh, Rousseff was a very firm believer in everything she did. And when it came to uh, Mercosur, one of her battle flags was to put Venezuela into Mercosur because she believed uh, in Venezuela. She was friends with Chavez. She believed in the project. And that made um, regional integration deeply ideological. And it wasn't good at the end of the day. And finally, Rousseff didn't really believe in multilateralism especially uh, especially economic multilateralism, but also political multilateralism. For the first time, uh, ever since the beginning of Nova Republica, Brazil didn't uh, present its candidacy to be in the Security Council for, for two years. Uh, we see in Rousseff's speeches at the United Nations that she didn't really believe in the UN. She despised most of the multilateral solutions to the world. So that was basically the the context of her foreign policy. And the consequences are uh, huge, right? If you look at the trade between Brazil and um, regions of the world, Africa, Middle East, the EU, China, the US, and Mercosur, you see that we have the same trend taking place with every single region in the world. The number one here is 2001. So, Trade grew exponentially. Let me draw it to make it clearer for you guys. So uh, trade grew exponentially for most of Lula's time in office. Trade had a setback here in 2008 for obvious reasons, but it kept growing right after uh, recovery, uh, 2009 and 10. Then it stagnated for most of Rousseff's time in office for reasons that sometimes do not relate to her whatsoever. But, and then, boom, it goes down. The same logic can be seen in every single region, going up and down like a roller coaster, right? And, and that was bad news for Brazil. The only partner with whom trade didn't go a, as much to the valley uh, was with China, but the rest, the trend is really staggering. Um, is Rousseff to blame? Well, not entirely, as I said, but the very fact that she didn't really believe in foreign policy as an instrument for development, I think it has uh, contributed to uh, a very, very meager results. And Rousseff, as I said, was impeached 
back in 2016, and a vice president who really staged his coming to power uh, with the opposition, he became the president. Michel Temer took office in early 2016, and the big difference between Temer and his two predecessors, Lula and Rousseff, was that Temer had no strings attached with the emerging power narrative that had prevailed for most of the, the past decade. So he didn't care about making Brazil a, a, an emerging power or sustaining Brazil's position as an emerging power. And judging by everyone who was around him and judging by his platform, he was okay with placing Brazil back into the condition of a middle power, right? So the pre-2003 condition, that was okay for him. And he understood that he was a, a, an interim, a temporary president. So he didn't care about like uh, uh, leaving a legacy, right? But the economist was still calling our attention to the dire situation of the country. Timmer, he became the president to appease the political forces in the country to appease the political establishment and the businesses and the foreign investors. And of course, uh, his only role was to uh, survive for two years before elections would take place. Uh, Tamer's context wasn't so uh, good either. If we look at Tamer's uh, political context, both at home and abroad, we see that he was also facing uh, many challenges. First of all, uh, when Temer became the president in Brazil, Trump got elected president in the United States a few months after Temer became the president. So uh, a new U.S. foreign policy was put in place, and, uh, and, and, and the Trump administration didn't really care about Latin America and didn't really want to know anything about Brazil. So that was the first thing. Uh, we, we didn't really construct many good relations with the United States, mostly because Trump was in office. The second thing is China was consolidating its dominance in trade and investments across the world, which meant that we, uh, we had to deal with China from a more pragmatic perspective. Um, China was an inevitable partner, but at the same time, it was much stronger than Brazil. So people were starting to criticize Brazil for becoming dependent on China, especially the agro-business sector. And the third element is the Venezuelan humanitarian crisis right along the border was dividing South America. Up until 2015, South America was pretty much united in dealing with Venezuela, in dealing with the Maduro crisis, in dealing with the humanitarian issues there. Uh, but after 2016, uh, every big South American country was moving away from one another. Temer, uh, on the domestic level, was going through a very interesting paradox. Temer was the president with the single greatest parliamentary support in Congress, but he had the lowest approval ratings of a president in the history of Brazil. He had 80% of congressional support and 2% of popular approval. So that was a big paradox. Uh, but since in Brazil, you can survive as a president being unpopular, but at the same time having a, a lot of parliamentary support, that was okay for Temer, especially thanks to his temporary condition. Uh, Brazil became even more divided uh, after 2016. Many people uh, accused Temer of plotting of staging a coup d'etat against President Rousseff, corruption scandals continued uh, um, popping up and they undermined the administration's credibility. And the only thing Temer could use as a lifeline was a very strong liberalizing agenda. So he said, I'm, I'm, I'm not here for long. I'll be around for two years. I'm going to make some very unpopular decisions. I'm going to open up the country. I'm going to reform a lot of different things. I don't care if people hate me, but I'm going to be around anyways. And that's pretty much how it, it turns out. Now, surprisingly, when it comes to foreign policy, he had a very mature foreign policy strategy. 
because Rousseff, uh, in, in, in the previous years, she had a very erratic foreign policy, as I said. She didn't really care about it. She didn't really value it. Tamer was the vice president of Rousseff, and he participated in many foreign policy events. She, she didn't want to attend, and then he went there. So Tamer had a very mature foreign policy perspective. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a critic of Tamer, but I really think that his foreign policy wasn't as bad as other areas of his uh, administration. And uh, in hindsight, I could call his foreign policy strategy a strategic pendulum or a, strat a pendular strategy, if I may, because Tamer had a very down-to-earth position right between the contradicting forces of the world uh, during the time he was the president. So he wanted to be friends with the United States, but also with China, both on pragmatic grounds. He wanted to push Brazil closer to the Pacific Alliance, which is an economic bloc of four countries, Mexico, Peru, Chile, and Colombia. So it's a more liberal bloc. But at the same time, he wanted to preserve Mercosur. He wanted to push Brazil closer to the OECD countries, uh, the developed world, but at the same time, he didn't want to abandon the BRICS group. So he was very mature when it came to maintaining the basic elements of Brazil's foreign policy. He didn't break with anything. He was a very normal president uh, when it comes to foreign policy. And then Bolsonaro came along. See, Bolsonaro's election was uh, an anomaly. In, in Brazil's history, because first of all, it broke with the dichotomy between the Social Democrats and the Workers' Party. Um, Brazil had only been governed by, by two parties uh, for the, the 20 preceding years, so Bolsonaro was different. He presented himself as an anti-system, as an anti-politics candidate, and, um, and he vowed to transform Brazil into a Western, Christian country. That was the platform. If you look at the, 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 the governing platform that he published during the presidential race of 2018, you see that his platform, policy platform was one uh, much along the lines of Trump, reinforcing the civilizational character of Brazil as a Western country, doing away with ideological influences coming from Latin America, coming from left-wing governments or left-wing partnerships around the world. And the role of religion, of course, was also very strong in how he conceived of Brazil's foreign policy. And then he won the elections. Um, I'm not going to get into the, the details of how he got elected, but he, he did. And ever since he got elected, uh, everyone out there was pointing out to a risk that Bolsonaro could represent to democracy, not only in Brazil, but also in Latin America. And that's the reason why the economists came up with this cover. Uh, Latin America's latest menace, basically uh, seeing Bolsonaro as a disruptive force in Latin American democracies, basically. Uh, because uh, as much as Trump, he is a far-right authoritarian populist. That's the... Um, and that's the reason why some people, especially liberals and left-wingers, were, um, were holding their breath. Now, we have to understand the context of Bolsonaro's uh, rise to power, first of all. Um, he's part of a conservative, populist, authoritarian wave that swept across the world, um, especially after Trump got elected in 2016. Many other candidates became stronger. Some were elected, some were re-elected in Hungary, in India, in the Philippines, and of course, Brazil was no exception for that. Another element of this uh, context is the trade and tech war between China and the United States that was shaking the global economy. And of course, it made it impossible for Bolsonaro's Brazil not to take sides with one of the two. And especially for the first two years in office, Bolsonaro took uh, sides with the United States very clearly. Uh, and that was, of course, a problem for uh, some of our economic sectors that were heavily reliant on China. 
And finally, the Venezuelan crisis became even uh, bigger uh, as of 2019. Venezuela had two presidents for most of the uh, last few years, and the crisis attracted major powers to South America, the US, Russia, and China. Trump even considered invading Venezuela at some point. So um, South America be became a hotspot for, for great power conflict. And that was a problem for Brazil, of course, because Brazil has always preferred stability <laughs> over instability. Now, we also have to understand the domestic political context of Bolsonaro's uh, administration, right? Uh, one of the first and most important things about his administration is that five groups were permanently scrambling for space uh, in his government. Uh, I call them the five Bs. It works in Portuguese, not so much in English, but the agro-business sector, the, the ruralists, uh, the military, the evangelical Christians, uh, the neoliberals, the pro-market, pro-banks, pro-deregulation folks, um, and the anti-globalists, uh, which is the more ideological slash conservative group uh, in the Bolsonaro administration. What we saw ever since the beginning of his ter term in office was a widespread institutional dismantling. So he basically wanted to hollow out political institutions so that he could uh, push forward his own political agenda with his own political ideology. And one of the trademarks of Bolsonaro's time in office is a permanent struggle, a permanent uh, bad blood between the executive branch, the government, and the Supreme Court and the parliament. So he basically pits the people against the Supreme Court all the time. He pits the people against uh, Congress uh, all the time too. And another aspect of Bolsonaro's political uh, condition is uh, that he waged a culture war against pretty much every traditional social gatekeeper. The media, the, the universities, the traditional political parties. So he was basically willing to destroy every single obstacle along his path to consolidate a a, a, a true Brazilian culture that was basically Western and Christian, right? So he fought pretty much everyone he believed didn't agree with his uh, own platform. Now, the important thing about Bolsonaro's foreign policy, I'm, I'm about to conclude, but uh, the important thing about his foreign policy is that unlike foreign policies in the past, that were deeply institutionalized around Itamarachi, around our foreign ministry, Bolsonaro's foreign policy was primarily populist. And of course, you may ask me, oh, wasn't it the case of Lula too? No. Lula and Rousseff and Cardozo, you name it, whatever president back in the day respected the traditions of foreign policy, respected the institutional uh, background of foreign policy, respected the foreign ministry. Um, that was not the case of Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro's foreign policy uh, involved uh, submitting Brazil's diplomatic guidelines to Bolsonaro's own personal or family power project. How he, did he do it? By communicating directly with the people through social media, by uh, destroying institutional gatekeepers or mediators, and by playing out a foreign policy that was highly personalistic. It was no longer about Brazil's relations with the United States. It was about Bolsonaro's personal relationship with Trump. It was not so much about Brazil's relations with Israel. It was about Bolsonaro's relationship with Benjamin Netanyahu. It was not about Bolsonaro's relationship with Argentina, but with President Macri. Now, uh, that comes, of course, with many problems. <laughs> the most important problem is if these presidents or governments uh, lose elections, if they leave office, Brazil's in trouble. Bolsonaro campaigned for Trump in 2020. Bolsonaro campaigned for Netanyahu in 2021. Bolsonaro campaigned for Macri in 2019, and they all lost elections. And th that was a problem for Brazil because, of course, if you have the president of Brazil campaigning for one of the sides and the other side wins, 
that's going to drive Brazil into complete isolation, especially among these partners. So populist foreign policy, especially in a country as central as Brazil, uh, a country that has uh, valued diplomacy so much throughout its history, this is indeed a big problem. Now, uh, aside from the bilateral consequences, uh, populist foreign policy has three very problematic traits, very problematic characteristics um, that also subvert the very logic of diplomacy itself. The first characteristic of a populist foreign policy is to offer easy solutions to complex problems. Remember hydroxychloroquine? Bolsonaro promoted chloroquine as a solution for the COVID-19 pandemic on the international stage. Bolsonaro went to, to meetings of the World Health Organization displaying a box of hydroxychloroquine. Uh, Bolsonaro has a very messianic approach to foreign policy, as to pretty much everything else, but uh, this messianic, uh, messianism or this messianic character is also a problem when it comes to foreign policy. Another element of populist foreign policy is the direct resort to the masses. Uh, Bolsonaro governs through social media, through spreading fake news on social media, usually uh, bringing a very strong conservative agenda to it. And finally, and this is something that goes against the very idea of diplomacy in the first place, uh, Bolsonaro's foreign policy is based on the friend foe dynamics. Brazil has partners, but Brazil has also enemies, according to ideology. So at some point in Bolsonaro's term in office, everyone was cons conspiring against Brazil. China, the Latin American countries uh, in the photo of Sao Paulo, Venezuela, the United Nations, NGOs, France, Germany, everyone was against Brazil at some point. So um, I think that, that that kind of behavior goes against the very essence of what Brazil's foreign policy used to be uh, in the past. And because there was a scramble of many different political groups to uh, be in charge of foreign policy, another aspect of Bolsonaro's populist foreign policy, aside from, aside from his own very personalistic approach to foreign policy, was a very erratic logic of foreign policy because at some point you, you didn't really know who spoke on behalf of foreign policy. Because the vice president, Hamilton Mourão, who was a military, who's a general, was saying one thing. But Paulo Guedes, the, uh, the finance minister, was saying something different. And Ernesto Araújo, the former foreign minister, was saying a third thing. And uh, interlocutors around the world didn't really know who to listen to. Uh, it's just like Ukraine now. Russia invaded Ukraine and Bolsonaro uh, was making compliments to Vladimir Putin, right? But then Brazil voted against Russia at the United Nations. And the question remains, uh, what's Brazil's side in this conflict? Is Brazil siding with Ukraine and NATO and the West, or is Brazil taking sides with Vladimir Putin and uh, Russia? So um, this is what I call a very erratic foreign policy on top of all that. The main elements of Bolsonaro's populist foreign policy are, as I said, ideological. It's based on a staunch anti-communist approach to foreign policy. So whoever, um, whatever country is governed by a left-wing government, I'm not going to talk to them because they're evil. Um, there's this anti-globalist approach, which basically means that everyone's conspiring against Brazil and everyone's against religion and everyone's against the traditional family values and so on and so forth. So Brazil has formed a, an anti-globalist front with Trump, Hungary, Poland, India, some Muslim countries to face this secular globalist plot against Brazil. And another very important element, just to wrap it all up, is religious nationalism. So basically, uh, you see Christian overtones all over Brazil's foreign policy ever since Bolsonaro took office. Uh, is Brazil a Christian country? Yes. But did Brazil place religion at, at the forefront of foreign policy? Never before. <laughs>
<laughs> so this is a, a novelty of Bolsonaro's uh, foreign policy. And of course, it all brings risks, right? One of the risks is the bad image that Brazil is witnessing today. Brazil, Bo Bolsonaro, that, that was a Financial Times article from last year. Bolsonaro was included in a four president ostrich alliance. Leaders that just denied the coronavirus threat from the outset. And that was the image that was put together with the article, Bolsonaro <laughs> behaving as an ostrich, pretending that nothing was going on while thousands of Brazilians were dying. We have the second worst track record in, in COVID-19 deaths so far, 700,000. Um, of course, the reputation, the global reputation of Brazil was just uh, destroyed along the way. Of course, it didn't start with Bolsonaro, but uh, it reached a, a peak under Bolsonaro. So that's also something that we have to think about. And finally, um, where do you want to go from this point on? I think that there is wide, widespread consensus in Brazil and in the rest of the world that Brazil has become a global pariah. But by saying that Brazil has become a global pariah is different from saying that Brazil became irrelevant in the world. You see, the Brazilian economy is still huge. Brazil is the world's seventh largest economy or something like that. Brazil is still very important in some multilateral places. Brazil is a, a very active uh, international player. Uh, we still have samba and soccer. So Br Brazil is not gone for good. But um, the fact that the Bolsonaro administration is seen as a pariah and it's isolated um, sort of pushes us into trying to change the circumstance, um, especially now that we are uh, on the verge of elections. And I'd say, and let me open up for questions right now if there's time, that we have basically three major foreign policy challenges for the next decade. Uh, that of course will depend on how the elections go in Brazil. The first one has to do with credibility. We have to rescue the functioning of our democratic institutions. Brazil has been considered by many NGOs and scholars out there as a faltering democracy on the verge of becoming an illiberal democracy. And of course, that's just the first step before becoming a full authoritarian country. Another thing that we have to deal with, and of course, that's gonna take a lot of foreign policy effort is to recover Brazil's centrality, Brazil's protagonism in international relations. And of course, that, that will demand a lot of effort because Brazil has uh, left many of the discussions that Brazil used to lead back in the day. And of course, Brazil has to uh, restore its foreign policy capacity. As I said, one of the trademarks of the Bolsonaro administration was to hollow out, to destroy political and governing institutions. So we will have to rebuild institutions from now on. We have to rebuild the diplomatic governance of Brazil for the 21st century, and that will uh, involve necessarily reshaping the Ministry of Foreign Relations, reconstructing the government, and re-empowering the state to conduct foreign policy affairs from this point on. Um, I had one question, so let me answer this question, and I'm going to open up for other questions if you guys want. Uh, Matilde de Souza is asking me, well, she, she says that uh, you have mentioned the fact that Brazilian military is surprisingly unimportant in terms of shaping the borders and that in general, Brazil has never been fond of using hard power, uh, military power to assert its international authority. Um, she, she's asking to what extent did the lack of national and international military influence uh, led to led the Brazilian army to have an influence on national politics instead. So I think that it's a, it's a good correlation right there. I mean, uh, but that's a problem about many Latin American countries, not just Brazil. Uh, 
whenever the military feel that they have no role in shaping the country's borders, they will try to meddle with national politics. This is a, a truism for most Latin American countries, and this is even truer for Brazil, especially because uh, Brazil had no wars, unlike some Latin American neighbors that had many border wars, Brazil had no wars whatsoever. So the military served uh, two purposes over the course of our history. Purpose number one, to keep the country united. There have been many uh, revolts, many protests, many uh, civil wars, and the military, <coughs> the military were a key in keeping the country united. Brazil has a huge territory, bigger than the sum of the other countries in South America. So, of course, the efforts were massive to keep everyone tight, tightly together. And the second role is, was, but still is, to keep politics stable. So whenever there was stability, political stability going around, the military jumped in. And sometimes they jumped in violently uh, through coups d'etat, 1930, 1964, for example. 1889, Brazil became uh, a republic, mostly through the hands of the military. So yeah, um, I, I'd say that our military, they are primarily a, a domestic political actor rather than being just a a foreign policy actor as in many other countries in the world. The second question is for a long time, uh, it was forbidden for Brazil to industrialize itself and to trade with other countries. Uh, was the emphasis on diplomacy a way for Brazil to cope for the lack of economic international relationships? Yes, uh, because uh, international trade in Brazil was seen as a private matter. So Brazil wanted to construct relations with the rest of the world through its reputation, through its political reputation. Um, and there's an interesting aspect to this. Uh, Brazil's diplomats have historically been white European men. Why was that so? Because the Brazilian empire and even the Republic in its beginnings wanted to display an image of Brazil as an Euro uh, a European, uh, a white European country. So basically our diplomats reflected the colonizing side of who Brazil was because that was the identity that we wanted to push for um, abroad. So our first emperor, Peter I, Dom Pedro I, he wanted to place Brazil in the concert of Europe. He wanted uh, Europeans to believe that Brazil was a, a tropical part of Europe. Um, and of course, it has a lot to do with this Western identity. Anthony is asking me, uh, BRICS seems to be increasingly re irrelevant as a grouping of nations. If Lula wins uh, the 2022 election, do you think Brazil would remain in BRICS given its decline in the situation with Russia? Yes. Um, everyone thought that Bolsonaro would just abandon the BRICS grouping as early as 2019, and it didn't happen. Um, I think it has to do with uh, uh, the essence of Brazil's character, right? We never want to seize something. We just let it die, right? We just let it die. So uh, Mercosur doesn't seem to be working properly. We're just letting it die. <laughs> Unisor stopped working as early as 2014 and we let it die. Until the day it really dies. But um, sometimes it's better to uh, uh, leave things to total irrelevance rather than pushing for destroying something, right? Uh, and even Bolsonaro, who's a very contentious figure, right? He didn't want bricks to die. He understood the BRICS as a platform for him to advance some of his foreign policy objectives, especially economic ones, because he understands the, the, the dependency Brazil has on China, for example. He understands that Russia has a lot to offer Brazil in terms of fertilizers, in terms of defense cooperation. He understands that India, especially under Narendra Modi, who's also a far-right authoritarian politician, he understands that India might be a partner in reshaping the world order. So why abandon the BRICS? Uh, in the case of Lula, I, I'd say that, that there's even uh, 
an additional emotional element attached to it because Lula created the BRICS in the first place back in 20, um, 2006, I guess. So Lula was the founding father of the BRICS together with the other countries. And if he comes back to, to office, he and Putin will be the two only original founding leaders of the BRICS that will be in office as of 2023. So I think uh, Lula has no reason whatsoever to abandon the BRICS. Of course, he's going to be demanded, especially by Western countries and the United States in particular, to position Brazil in the context of the Russian-Ukrainian war or the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Bolsonaro participated uh, in the BRICS meeting a week or two ago, and he didn't say a word about Ukraine. And well, I, I don't think Lula will be able to get away with that. He will have to position himself regarding the Russia-Ukrainian conflict, but um, I don't think that leaving the BRICS is an option, uh, not at all. And I personally think that uh, relations with Russia will remain in place. Um, there is no reason to break relations with Russia. Brazil will, will be the, the, one of the few uh, bridges between Russia and the West. And that might even be good for Western countries, really, because no one wants to completely isolate Russia from the world. They understand the, the, the consequences of sanctions, and they are not necessarily good. So they have to take sides with Ukraine, but they do not want to alienate Russia completely. So Brazil might be even a, a tool in, in this case. Professor Guilherme, uh, if you have a few minutes, I have a I question. <laughs> sure. Okay, I know where, I mean, uh, so my, my question is, you have mentioned, for example, that Lula's successful government was not necessarily due to Lula himself as a person, but uh, greatly because of the situation the world was in. But then again, Lula is a very um, uh, is a very important personality as you know as a, a public figure, and of course um, he was in Europe, for example, and he reached places even Bolsonaro didn't reach as a pre the president of oh, Brazil. Yeah. Do you think the world can detach the the Brazilian foreign policy to Bolsonaro's? figure and then understand that this is about him as a person and not about Brazil. How much damage do you think Bolsonaro did? To, to what extent our image as a country was damaged by what he has been doing at, as a foreign as foreign policy is concerned? Okay. Um well, I think he did great damage to Brazil's image uh, in the world, but um, it, it's still recoverable. We can still... You think it's detached from Brazil? I mean, they, they understand that this is Bolsonaro doing something personally and not Brazil doing something do. personally. I think they do. Uh, I, I mean, the world understands that Bolsonaro is uh, the incumbent president of Brazil, but... I think it's the same with Trump. I mean, we know that Trump doesn't speak on behalf of all Americans. We know that Orban doesn't speak on behalf of all uh, Hungarians. Um, as much as we know that Maduro doesn't speak on behalf of all Venezuelans. However, um, things only get worse as these leaders remain in power for too long. Because today, it's very hard to detach uh, Venezuela from Maduro's own regime. And that's why we call the regime a regime, not just a government or an administration, because it's a, a long-standing thing. As much as it's hard to tell the difference between Vladimir Putin's regime and Russia uh, as of today. The good news for Brazil is that we're still a democracy, a faltering one, a problematic one, an unstable democracy, but we still are, uh, which means that if we're having elections this year, and I hope we do, uh, the very logic of alternation of power allows us to detach 
uh, the, gov the, 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 the incumbent government from the longstanding goals of Brazil's foreign policy. But my take on this is diplomats are particularly concerned uh, about a, a, a Bolsonaro re-election at this point. Because one thing is, four years of scorched earth policies, four years of destruction, four years of uh, institutional dismantling, as I said. Another thing is eight years. And another completely different thing is eight years with the possibility of staying around for as long as he wants, because that's what Orban did in Hungary. He changed the constitution. Chavez did it too, changing the constitution to remain in power. Right. So when uh, Harvard professors Stephen Lewitsky and Dan Ziblatt wrote about how democracies die, they were no longer talking about coups d'etat with tanks taking over the streets and all. They were talking about institutional corrosion to the point of uh, not being able to call a democracy a democracy anymore. So I, I think that uh, um, this is what we have to bear in mind. From what we know, from experience, India, Hungary, the Philippines, if a far-right authoritarian populace stays around for too long, that's bad news for the country. That's bad news for, for democracy. Let, let's put it this way. Um, and that's the reason why many diplomats out there are just waiting for the next government to, to take office. And it, it doesn't matter. You see, uh, it doesn't mean that they are pro-Lula. They want Bolsonaro out of office because they know the, the extent of the destruction that Bolsonaro was able to promote uh, when it comes to relations between Brazil and Germany, for example, or Brazil and France. You see, the, 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 the president of Portugal came for the celebrations of the uh, bicentennial of Brazil's independence. And I mean, Bolsonaro didn't, didn't meet him because he had a meeting with Lula. So all of the, this like childish and jealous behavior um, doesn't help, especially if you're talking about diplomacy. And I think that the reason why, and just as a side and final note, you see, Bolsonaro very irresponsibly traveled to Moscow uh, one week before the invasion of Ukraine, right? And many people were questioning why, why they were doing this. Why did they decide to... Uh, uh, why did Bolsonaro decide to travel to Russia, knowing that a war, a war was around the corner? And the answer is because Bolsonaro, uh, since he has no legacy in foreign policy to show his supporters, he was competing with Lula to, to, to prove that he is not as isolated as many uh, criticize him for being. Bolsonaro went to the G20 meeting in Italy in November last year. No one wanted to talk to him. No foreign leader wanted to meet uh, on the sidelines of the meeting uh, with Bolsonaro. So Bolsonaro had to, to uh, talk to the waiters uh, during the ceremony because he, he didn't even show up for the last picture of the, the leaders of the G G20. So that was the size of the isolation of Bolsonaro, right? And then as he came back, Lula went to Europe and he was hosted at the European Parliament and by European leaders, German, French leaders. So that was the moment he decided to go to Russia because out of all countries that Bolsonaro could travel to, Russia was the, the biggest and the most relevant of them. He went to Hungary too, but Russia was the, the highlight of the trip. And of course, he wanted, he, he wanted to show his supporters and of course, some of the world's media that he's not uh, an isolated president. But of course, he kind of backfired because he went to Russia, the war started, and now everyone's wondering whether Bolsonaro supports Putin or not, right? In, in any case, I, I think that uh, people are mature enough to understand that Bolsonaro and Brazil are different things, but it always depends on how long uh, a, a, a president sticks around. And now I swear it's the last one, but I need to ask you this question. Sure. I know you are no fortune teller, 
But uh, what's the risk of Bolsonaro getting uh, reelected? And what's the risk? Because now he has all these programs for distributing money to people, buying votes, in my opinion. But anyways, um, what's the risk of him? I mean, you know, turning around the election and winning. Uh, and what's the risk of us having a coup? Okay. Um, one thing is intimately connected with the other, right? So um, the chances of we having a, a, a self-coup, uh, in English, we don't even have a word for that. So they, they sometimes call it autogolpe in, in Spanish uh, because Peru had an autogolpe back in 1992. That was 30 years ago, exactly. Um, well, I think that the chances of a, an autogolpe increase as Bolsonaro perceives that he's about to lose the elections. Every single poll shows Lula between 10 and 15 percent ahead of Bolsonaro. And that, of course, is bad news for uh, Bolsonaro because he's the incumbent president. He has the, the all, all the government policies in his hands. He can play out many different things to try and get reelected. Um, it's going to be the first time uh, a president doesn't get reelected in Brazil ever since reelection was approved. Um, so I think that uh, Bolsonaro is facing a very unfavorable circumstance right now. However, um, he still rules the country. And, and, and of course, it, it's not hard for him to keep uh, uh, using populist policies. I'm not even going to talk about foreign policy, but economic policies, redistribution policies to help um, his reelection, right? To, to, to allow for his reelection campaign. Now, most of these policies do not seem to be working. We've just had a new round of uh, polls by Quaesh, right? And one of the, the owners of the, the uh, company that, that makes these polls is also a professor at UFMG, right? Felipe Nunes. And um, Quaesh is showing like 45 to 32, I guess, or something like that. Uh, so the distance between Bolsonaro and Lula hasn't changed so much. So the impression that I have is if that distance remains pretty much the same until August or September, the elections are gonna take place in October, um, the chance of an attempt of canceling the elections, of calling out fraud, of trying to subvert democracy increased dramatically. And we have to remember that last year on September 7th, which is the celebration of Brazil's independence, um, Bolsonaro almost went full coup mode. Um, at least that's what some reporters have, have said, right? Bolsonaro was about to stage a, a, an autogolpe, right? Um, that might happen again. We don't know. Uh, but th that's my take. I'm no fortune teller, as you said, but I'd say that the risk of a coup increases as Bolsonaro realizes that he won't be able to get elected, right? And a coup is not a coup with tanks in the streets. A coup is Bolsonaro backed up by high-ranking military saying that the election is fraudulent, saying that he's not going to accept the results, saying that uh, the electronic ballots are un unreliable and so on and so forth. Uh, but this is terrible news for Brazil because we have precedents around the world from Myanmar to the United States that whenever it happens, violence ensues and it's not good news for anyone. Okay, Professor Guilherme, thank you very much. It was such an honor having you here with us. Very insightful session. Um, it was incredible. It was amazing. And it was very nice uh, hearing from you. And again, I thank you for accepting our invitation. And I do hope to see you soon then, if you visit us here at UFMG. <laughs> I surely will. Thank you so much. And I hope you have enjoyed.
we have very much. Okay, guys, let's open our um, cameras so that we can take a picture of the session. It's been great. So, guys, we'll see each other tomorrow morning, hopefully. <laughs>